We're on. <laughs> Welcome. Sign Christian Ministries. I am Pastor John McKim. If you can't find me, that's what you look me up for on YouTube if you want to look at the sermon or Zion Christian Ministry. Today's message is called, What Stirs Your Heart? What Stirs Your Heart? And what's interesting is Brandon prays a prayer very similar to that about his heart being stirred up to go after God. And then Terry gives us a dream and vision about her heart being stirred up about things. So I'm sitting there going, okay, I heard God this morning. Now maybe I can sit down and let them take over. Um, <laughs> but they're probably not ready. Okay? So um, I'm not sure how it's going to work out for our scripture. We, we're going to use the scripture, but how much we'll do, get done today. Because um, there's a lot on my heart. But, Jackie, could you put up uh, chapter 17, starting at verse 16, please? We'll go down for sure, Jackie, probably down to minimum of verse 23. We may go far than that. I don't know. You guys ready? ready. Dan's ready. Ready? ready. ready? ready? Thank you. I want participation. Jesus is a participating guy. Amen? Amen. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, remember he had left Thessalonica because of the stirring up of those, I mean, at Berea, stirred up by those from Thessalonica. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Euperian and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to proclaim a foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Aravagus, saying, may we know, and it could be translated Mars's Hill, okay, May we know what his new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners were, who were there spent their time in, knowing, in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of them at Mars Hill. I'm going to say it that way. And said to them, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considered the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. We will stop there for now. So he's in Athens. And it was a center point of a lot of philosophy. They were willing to want to just expand their minds and go into all kinds of conversations and topics. So when I look at this passage, it's kind of what we're doing today in the world. All this philosophy on how people feel and what they are and what you think and all this stuff working out in the natural. And so in Athens, that's what they like to do. They like to sit around and Find something new and go into all these different ways of trying to find out truth. But when Paul walked around, he saw these statues and all these things of foreign gods, other gods. So in the rest, he said, hey, guys, you're really religious. In other words, you're always worshiping something. But there's a word that jumped off the page when I was preparing this, provoked. He was provoked. His spirit was provoked. He had just gone through Thessalonica where he was run out. He'd been at Berea where he was saw encouragement, and then they were, he was chased out of there. So his heart was stirred up as he goes to Athens and sees all this idol worship. Could you put up that for definition, please? Provoke. To stir up purposely. I'm here to provoke you today. 
to stir you up purposely. That's what the Spirit of God is meant to do. The Spirit of God's supposed to come upon us and stir us up with a purpose. So he was provoked. He was stirred up inside. And his spirit man did not like what he was seeing. He understood that his call was to preach the gospel and bring people to salvation. And so he's going about the world, the new world, the world then, and running into all these different religions and gods that they worshipped. And so he right away got all stirred up. Put up the next word, please. Stir. To cause a specially slight movement and change of position to disturb the quiet. <laughs> I call it Laodicea. <laughs> to stir. So when Terry shared a word, she was stirred. God came in and stirred something up in her and wanted her to gain some revelation from him. Are we stirred in the season that we're living in? See? I heard conversation as I was praying, not really listening. I don't even know what uh, the worship team was talking about with my wife about fentanyl overdoses. And, you know, we, we talk about all the, the drugs being spread about, and we see homeless, we see all these things going on. You know what happens after a while? It becomes commonplace. We, we don't like it, but it becomes commonplace. It kind of takes away the stirring from us. Well, I saw something flash in front of me. Back in 1990s, there was a man named Timothy McVeigh. Does anybody remember who Timothy McVeigh is? He was a veteran who felt that everything was going sideways and he wanted to cause a revolution and he pulled up a U-Haul truck full of fertilizer and explosion and blew up a building in Oklahoma City that killed 168 people, even children. He was stirred up. Now he was believing lies. See? And everybody was pretty messed up over that when you see them pulling dead babies out of the, bo out of the bottom of the nursery and people dying and half that building tore off. Okay. But then it kind of fades away. We can even go back farther in our history and we can remember what would happen in 1964 and 65 in Selma, Alabama and and the marches for, for people to get rid of Jim Crow laws that they might get the right to vote. And they walked across this bridge. Emmett, I can't remember, is it in Selma, but I can't remember the name. But anyway, the bridge was named after the Grand Dragon of the KKK. And they came across the bridge, and they were met by policemen and horses and guns, and they beat them half to death and let them lay. Because all they wanted to do was have the right to vote. And it stirred the nation to watch it on time as they had fire hoses and beating people with clubs. And they were nonviolent. But four months after that, they passed the voting right bill. Because why? Because Congress got stirred up, the president got stirred up from Texas, and they did something. Whether right or wrong, whatever you believe, I'm not here speaking politically. I'm talking about what stirs our hearts. When we watch the news or whatever we watch, most people don't anymore because they just can't handle the negativity. But we see things go on all the time that are just drastic and broken and painful, and we don't want to look at it. So the enemy says, oh, I'm the God of denial. How do we know he's the God of denial, Satan? Because he denied the glory of God. He denied the king of kings. He denied the throne room. He denied that he could be like God. So he's got to be the master of denial. Because it came over him. And because it came over him, therefore he was what? Judged. And he no longer was Lucifer, made beautiful, as it says in Ezekiel 28. But he was now Satan, ugly, distorted, and twisted. Because he lived in denial. 
So his whole purpose as he, as he comes against the body of Christ and Christ himself is to take us and deny our hearts, not be stirred. But the Apostle Paul, he goes into Athens, and man, he stirred up. It disturbed the quiet in him. God wants to remove the quiet in you today. It can't be done, and this is my prayer for you this morning. I can't do it. I say, God, I can't do this. You're giving me this message, but I can't do it. I, the, you could give me every perfect phrase and some excitement to tickle their minds, to get them to think, oh, my God, yes, he's right. But it isn't going to change you. I can't do it. But a few weeks ago, I talked about the unction of the Spirit of God. So my prayer for you today is that some unction would come over you that is not that God would use my words, he might fill my mind, he might fill my heart, but something would stir in you and would provoke you. Because then he gave me a prophetic word, which I'll probably give at the end of the message, and, and the whole point being is something's coming and nobody knows it. The prophets are not prophesying the things of God. They're telling you everything's okay. I'm telling you it ain't. I'm telling you it's a time where everything is being stirred up. And so in the ministry I do, maybe it's because what I do is why maybe I am the way I am. And after 30 years of doing deliverance and inner healing and whatever, whatever people want to label what we do, that it keeps me stirred up. When people come in with bondages and pain, dysfunction, torment, their minds broken, their bodies broken, the lives of the enemy stealing their identity, walking in pain and destruction, and then I watch the power and the glory of God come in the room, not because of me or Pastor Paul, it's because of his heart for them, and he allows us to watch the deliverance and healing of people. So it keeps me stirred up about God. I get excited. And, and I know maybe some of you might get tired of my, me being excited like me yelling and screaming this morning during worship. I saw miracles this week. Hallelujah. I cannot sit back while you guys sit on your hands and let you be the dictate of my excitement. I can't let other people dictate any more to me about, oh, now don't do this because this isn't how the American culture functions in church. No, I want the church to function as it does in heaven. Your citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. And therefore, we should obey the heavenly way of excitement about the king. But, you know, we, we, we must be reserved because here it is. We don't want to offend people that don't understand. They don't know why this pastor gets excited and starts screaming hallelujah. But I ain't screaming hallelujah for you. I'm screaming hallelujah to my Savior. I'm seeing excitement for my Savior. And as long as we let what people react and how we react to our God, then we will never be stirred. You'll never be provoked. Because the enemy is good of telling, telling you to calm down. He's good. Well, that just doesn't match my personality. I guarantee you if your blood washed, you'll be different when you're in heaven. I guarantee your personality in heaven won't be dictated by the things of the world anymore. You're going to see a glory that is undes undescribable, the beauty that's too much to handle, the glory of eternity forever that is yours right now, and you will not be able to contain yourself after you get off your face. And when you look at the myriad of 
thousands of people worshiping all at the same time. When there is no more tear, no more sadness, no more disease, no more brokenness, no more sin. That's why it's going to take eternity to give him all glory. But we become religious just like the Athenians. Those in Greece, they had so many things going on that we have idols in our heart. I think as Terry's putting it there, there's idols that come up. Our children, maybe our spouses, our job, whatever it might be. They're idols, people. Anything put before the living God is an idol. So I'm listening to Terry. Christian goes, Terry had a dream. Here it is. I read it. I went, okay, God. So it encouraged me because I'm hearing what God is speaking to his people. And I'm trying to get you provoked. But I've been provoked. I have been stirred. I have been agitated. My spirit is upside down angry at the devil and what he does to God's creation. If you would just get as stirred up as God is stirred up. How stirred up was God? He sent his only begotten son to pay for our sins and destroy the works of that devil. How big was it to God? He gave his son, and it says it well pleased him to bruise him and send him to the cross. That is a love that we cannot understand until we see him in person. We surely can practice it. When are we going to wake up to the fact of what God has done for us and this, there should be footprints on my back at, on Sunday morning as you run me over to get to the altar of God and proclaim your salvation with joy overmore? Oh, but don't you get these people too stirred up, he says, because all we want to do now is come to church and not be left alone and not to be stirred up or provoked because we don't want people to think anything weird about us. Well, I'm telling you right now, if you're a child of God, it's weird if you're not provoked and stirred up. So I said this morning, I had no idea what I was going to preach this morning, so... I, you know, and some people are here because they can't even stir it up enough to, because the clock went forward an hour. It messes their whole life up. <laughs> I play a game with my wife every year. Honey, I look at the clock. I go, honey, it's really 5 o'clock when it's 4 o'clock. All the time. Drive her nuts. Stop it. <laughs> honey, it's 7. But it's really 8 o'clock. So when we fall back, I go, honey, no. And, and, and this is one of the times here as a pastor, I don't like it because, Pastor, it's hard. We lost an hour. How about lose your life for Jesus? <laughs> the things that disturb us and the things that should disturb us. I'm disturbed. Put up that other definition, please. Agitate. To excite. <laughs> Often trouble the mind on feelings disturbed. I am disturbed for Jesus. I'm agitated. My spirit is all worked up inside. You know why? Because his spirit is all worked up. His spirit is grooming over the earth. His spirit is looking at the abuse of children, looking at addiction, looking at perversion, looking at sin. His spirit is stirred up. And when the spirit comes upon us, we go, well, hold it now, God. That's not how we do it in tradition of our religion. I watched a video the other day, and one of the ministries we support, we support is Iris Ministries in Mozambique. And how you sitting there asking for prayer as she puts her arm around her grandma, who had her whole family slaughtered and cut up in front of her because they, the, the other religion was killing their pastors and killing the children and chopping them up. They would have to find their body parts to put them all in the same grave. But behind it were all these Africans and all they were doing was worshiping God and blessing their salvation even though their families had been slaughtered. I'm agitated because that's what the enemy does. 
But we sit in our complacency. We sit in our feelings. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, help me with my hangnail. That's a dramatization, but I'm not here to rebuke you. I'm telling there's something coming to you, and if you don't get it, you're going to be really disturbed. You're really going to be agitated. You're going to be in fear and bondage like you've never imagined. It's my job in a prophetic way to tell you what's coming, so when it happens, I will not have the blood on my hands. See, I have to answer to the master. I have to tell what the master is on his heart. I got to, because it says too many times in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, if you do not speak to them, if you do not tell them what's coming, it will be upon your head. But if you tell them and they do not come, it will be on their head. But if they turn and repent, then it will be a joyous moment. But you got to tell them. You got to let them know. And so, read the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and see what they were facing with the people that didn't want to hear it. Don't tell us everything's good. We all, can, we all like to uh, quote Jeremiah 29 about the thoughts I have towards you, right? I'll just do that. I've got to do it. This is what charismatics, you charismatic, we just like doing this. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's just, we like to pull a scripture out and make it our, on our refrigerator, but we don't do it in context. I know, I know, context. <laughs> Pastor Paul just heard that in the spirit somewhere. <laughs> we love this passage. Here it is. This is what we, oh, we love it. Thank you, Jackie. And I know the thoughts I think towards you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Oh, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. We quote that, so we're waiting for the blessing of that big check to come in the mail. But in the context, what he was telling everybody is, you're not listening to me. This is what God wants, but you back up a few verses, it isn't good. He said, guess what? You're going to build houses and grow them, plant gardens and eat fruit, your wives and big up sons and daughters, but you're going to be in bondage. He says, while you're in bondage, this is what I want for you. But you must repent to get this blessing. But us charismatics, oh, that's just, okay, let's put that up on the overhead and we're all going to get worked up. Hallelujah, God's good. He is good. But what Jeremiah was trying to say, you're listening to false prophets. It isn't good. But if you turn to me, it will be. Do we always miss the turn? You're going down a road and you miss your turn off. How long do you go down that road before you turn around? When we're going home on 36, we can tell when somebody's lost. They're slowing down. They're slowing down. Sometimes they feel a blinker. Oh, no, that's not the driveway. <laughs> then they get farther up and then they flip a Yui. Because they did, they, 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 how long? They realize they're lost, so they turn around. Are you going to turn around? Are you going to turn around? Are you going to awaken yourself to what's going on? Years ago, there was a vision in the 1970s. I know some of you weren't born yet over here and over there, and you're in the mind of God, but you were not yet, okay? And they had this vision. Now, what was the name of that cartoon where that big giant was tied down, Gulliver Travels? Remember that show? And remember, it was so cute when we were growing up watching it, and they had all these little people staking <laughs> these strings down, and he's tied down, old Gulliver. He couldn't get up because he was tied down. 
And he was a giant in the land. Well, somebody had a vision. And they saw this giant. And his head was in the north valley, north of the valley, and his feet went all the way down to Porterville in Bakersfield. And it was this giant giant. And he was sleeping. And in this vision, ready? He was sleeping. And the person who had the vision said, God, what does this mean? What is, it? what is this? And God said, it's my church. They're asleep. But when I awaken them in this valley, they're going to stand up. My church is going to stand up, and it's going to change the whole state and the whole nation in this vision. I remember meeting one of the guys years ago in Chico who was part of that. Remember that, Pastor Mike, older guy? He had laid his whole life down, never to marry, and to pray for 50 years when I'd met him. And he got ridiculed and beat up. They, they, they called him, he must be homosexual because he never married. And he would worship God and play his piano, calling on the giant to wake up. Okay? Great vision. Well, probably now five years or more, somewhere in there, a pastor's wife in town won't mention the church because she's still in town. And they're having a prayer meeting. And they couldn't get anybody to come pray, two or three people. So one night during prayer, she goes, God, what is going on? I don't understand it. We have all this going on in our city. We need prayer. We need to break through. We need this. And God gives her a vision of a giant in the valley. She did not know about that vision in the 1970s. And she saw the giant waking up. He's lying like this, and his head starts to come up, and the demonic shows up. Begin to rub the face of the giant, and he goes back to sleep. So when that came to me, I sent the message back, keep praying. It's the demonic that's holding back the Church of Jesus Christ for the awakening, for the revival in the last days. And then there's a fight over, well, where's the head at? Okay? And... I've heard many people from Chico to Redding, they want to claim that they're the head. Everybody wants to be the head. Well, there's a man I prayed with for years, Glenn, who is a geologist. He's now moved to Elk Grove area a few, months, a few weeks ago. So I asked him a geographic question. Where does the valley of Central Valley in? He goes, a mile up the road from Red Bluff. I go, what do you mean? You understand, the valley ends, and up, if you start going up, you're now in a different topography. So Redding isn't the head of the valley. Chico isn't the head of the valley. Red Bluff's the head of the valley. Are you ready for this? We're the head. So, everybody sleep last night? Everybody took sleep. How do you get up? Do your feet wake up first? <laughs> Does your neck wake up first? No? No? Okay. So it's your head that begins to wake up. And as you begin to wake up, then your head tells your feet to move to go to the bathroom real quick. Okay? Because something wakes you up. And it's in your head, it wakes you up. So, listen, if I was really a smart, demonic man who worshipped darkness, you know what I would do? I would try to put that head to sleep. I would do everything I could to keep the head from rising up. Because if the head wakes up, then the neck wakes up. And then the hands wake up. 
and the whole body begins to stir because the body can't stand up until the head wakes up. And so we've had many conferences, Pastor Mike I've gone to for years in prayer with pastors, and they all want to be the head. And I try not to laugh. And, and you ready for this? I wish another town was the head that they would wake up and then we would wake up. Okay? I, I'm, not, I'm not excited about us being the head. Don't get me wrong. Because there's a greater responsibility while being the head. But with greater responsibility would come what? Greater victory. Okay? So I'm provoked and stirred up just like Paul is stirred up because he goes into a place full of idol worship. Okay? And in that idol worship, he sees all these, these things painted and, and done all of that. And darkness is over, all over Athens, and, and you ready? they want to philosophize about Christ. He is not a philosophy. He is a king. He is creator. He is almighty. He is everything. He's high and lifted up. There's no name above any other name that one might be saved. He is everything. And through him, everything was made. That all things it, it consist because of him. And so what he wants to do is he wants to stir us up. The next thing, as I'm worshiping God this morning, he says, awaken the dead in me. That's what my prayer was for me. Awaken what is dead in me. And then Brandon prays it. Awaken what is dead. No, I didn't pray for you yet. Awaken for what is dead in me. See, supposedly, according to Scripture, which I believe, are you ready for this? I'm a new creation. All things have passed away and all things become new. But there's parts of me that need to be renewed. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 May the God of peace himself sanctify you whole, spirit, soul, and body. Okay? When? Until the coming of the Lord. So, I really have to stop thinking that I'm okay. I got to quit thinking that, oh, I've been serving God since 1986. Therefore, I'm Okay. I can't live that way anymore. i got to live in my comparison. Your comparison isn't with me. It isn't with your spouse. It's with the word of God and the king of kings. That's where you compa compare yourself. I'm serious. And what we've done is we compare ourselves to other people in our faith, pastors in our faith. Pastors compare themselves to pastors. Worship leaders compare themselves to worship leaders. Singers to singers, Bible teachers to Bible teachers. No, it's Christ. That's who we compare ourselves to. And you know why we don't? Have you seen him lately, how good he is? Do you understand that we might not be good if we compare ourselves to him? But you are saved. You're a new creation. You know, and we were gone through the Bible study in Genesis, and Pastor talked about creation, right? Did it happen in one day? Oh, it didn't, did it? Did it happen in two days? No. Oh, so over time, God did a creation moment. Hello? If you got saved, there's a creation moment going on in you. There's a creation moment by the Spirit of God that wants to come and finish you the way you're meant to be. Because we're made in the image and likeness of Christ. And our comparison is to him. It isn't with judgment. It isn't with religious work. It isn't anything but grace. It's him coming and molding us. As Jeremiah said, he's the potter. We're the clay. He puts his hand on us and puts us on that spinning wheel and takes away the cracks, the scars, the hurt, until it's a perfect vessel. That's who he is. 
And so we must understand is if today, if you're okay with God, that's good. But if Christ Jesus walked in today, and we all had to stand in, okay, we're going to line it up. Christ is here. I want you to step in front of him now. Yeah, that's probably what would happen. <laughs> that, yep, that, that's what would happen. We'd be screaming because we would be, oh, my God, I'm dirty, filthy rags. We would have the Isaiah moment of chapter 6. Oh, unclean lips I am before the glory of God. And he would have a cherubim standing here, and he'd have a cherubim standing here full of fire, and we would walk up and go, oh. Because we would see who he is and see who we are. And we're afraid to do that. But you ready for this? He wants you to do that because he wants to make you whole. Because he promised. He wants to make you whole. He wants to come on you. He wants to finish you. He wants to make you every way. Because in Psalm 139, he said he knew you before you were formed. And he called you good and special and all these things. And then sin nature came in and messed us up. So Christ died so that we might be put whole. So I want to stir your heart, not towards me, but towards Christ himself. I want you to realize that we, th this altar is not a place to get blessed. It's to change you. Jeremiah, Jeremiah. That kid can never get enough food. Brandon goes giving gravy and mashed potatoes. and <laughs> It's okay, Jeremiah. I'm probably stirring you up. Because, you see, he knows. He ain't long since he's been there. So what idol is within us that keeps us from the fire of God? That was the next question God popped in my head. What idol? Kids, wife, job, money, house, pet, whatever it might be. I don't know what it is. Your favorite football team, your favorite baseball team, your favorite soccer team, your favorite rugby team. I don't care what it might be. It could be food. I'm struggling with food. I am. I dream of things I shouldn't be eating. <laughs> but then I put on a pair of pants today that I couldn't put on two months ago. I, I, can, I can begin to buy pants that say slim on them. <laughs> and even in that, I still want to go and do something contrary that would make me slim. Now listen to that. Because it's deep in me, this desire of food that was always my comfort. It was always my comfort. I could out-eat anybody. I used to get through college by betting on how much I could eat to make five bucks. I'm serious. This guy said, you can't eat that much. I tell you what, if... I eat this much, will you give me five bucks and pay for my lunch? Because I needed food. He goes, no deal. I had a Big Mac, quarter pounder, fish sandwich, two fries, and I can't remember how little hamburgers to go with it. All in one sitting. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hammered it. I needed the five bucks. Okay. I missed my afternoon class because in Bakersfield it was warm. I laid down underneath this tree. I was dead. <laughs> I went to sleep, got my five bucks, and missed class. I know why food is my comfort because I was always by grandma saying I would eat grandma. Oh, you want another bowl of that soup? And I would get affirmation. I still have pictured that until she told me what type of soup it was. I hammered three big bowls of this vegetable beef soup. 
and on the going for the fourth ball. She said, Isn't that good? I said, Yeah, it is, Grandma. It was tongue and oxtail. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, it was good though. It was good. <laughs> tongue and oxtail. Grandma goes, you want scrambled eggs and brain, uh, and brain, brain for, for breakfast? breakfast? No, 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 no. It was my comfort, okay? So I, I, I want to lose weight because I need to lose weight, but it, it's confronting something deep inside me. I mean, as soon as I get done eating, I think I'm hungry. I'm not hungry. It's what's in me that pushes me to be comforted. My wife, you can't be hungry. Did you see what you ate? We all have an idol within us, or idols. We all have something that puts ourselves ahead of Christ. What contents you? What makes you content? What makes you content? Okay? Right now, for whatever reason, Jeremiah is content. Because mom is holding him because he wanted to be held and wanted to be rocked and wanted to be moved. Now he's content. You know, I don't know what this is that God does with women. They're doing this and they <laughs> rock, but it contents them. Well, I know what it is. Last time they were there, he was floating around a bunch of water <laughs> and mom would walk and it'd rock him to sleep. And we want to know why babies like to be rocked. It takes him back to a moment of contentment inside mom. I'm serious. Think about it. He may only have been that big, but man, that was swishing around, and this is good. He's being rocked all the time. Yeah. So, babies want to be content. Has your faith made you content and you're not on fire? Are you happy the fact that you might be okay? That doesn't line up with God. The Apostle Paul was never at contentment. He was provoked. He was so provoked that he would go from city to city in the known world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It didn't matter if he went to Ephesus. It didn't matter if he went to Thessalonica. It didn't matter if he got stoned, beaten, shipwrecked steel rods on his back, whatever was going to be beat with. Sickness, disease, coldness, famine. Go ahead and read what he went through. But it was nothing compared to what he's provoked for, the glory of God. He was hungry for the glory. See, to look up content, it means satisfied. And we have become satisfied with our salvation. There's nothing more exciting to have someone who gets saved, who wants the fire of God in them, and they're hungry for it, and watch God give it. And they burn. And they want more. See, I remember I went on strike in the mill back in the late 80s. And uh, I, was in, I was saved then, and this man gave me a job working in a lawn service. And it stuck with me forever, how to do it with a weed eater, how to edge, how to make the lawn look good, all of that. And I was on fire for God. I was just on fire. I went from making ten fifty an hour to four twenty five an hour. But I was happy. You know what this believer told me? You'll be okay. In a few years, you'll calm down. That's what he told me. I've been a Christian for 25 years. You'll settle down. Well, it wasn't a prophetic word from God. I've been told, well, this Come on now. Don't be this way. And I'm on my knees after I'm saved, and I ask God, why didn't I die on that head-on wreck at 55 miles an hour? 
head on with no seatbelt on. Why did I live? Why did I walk out? I had an angel hanging on your belt loop and kept you from going through the window. Because I was on my way to hell because I had cocaine in my pocket, marijuana in my jacket, and I was on my way to hell. I don't forget that. 1981. I didn't forget. Then I got saved and realized it was God that saved me from hell eternal. I'm sorry. I'm stirred up. I'm agitated. I'm provoked. You know what? Maybe we need to see hell. Maybe we really need to see what we've been delivered of. So we won't be satisfied with our salvation alone, but the joy of the victory of the cross. Well, you know, you can't stay that way all the time. That's the next thing the devil says. You really can't. I mean, how can you stay fired up all the time? His mercies are new every morning, and you call upon him, he'll meet you. Do you understand fire is a choice? So my wife left town, and she and her mom for a couple days, and so me and the herd of animals, I took care of them. And, and, and so right now my wife has a thermostat problem, and, and so I keep the house cold, kind of, okay? And by the end of winter, I'm tired of building a fire because that's how we heat our home. So I'm a little tired of getting up and building a fire, building a fire, building a fire. So I didn't build a fire. Because I was tired of doing it. I was cold, so I built a fire. Because see, if you don't keep a fire going, you get cold. So I built a fire before I went to bed last night. Put certain pieces on, know how long it took. Got up and there was still some coals. I just took some kindling, put some more pieces in. Got up. House was warm. And I'm done praying because I kept the fire going. That's how you keep the fire. You got to keep putting wood on. Are you ready for this? What if you are the pieces of wood that keeps the fire going? What if we kind of put two or three people together who are on fire? And, you know, when you build fire, you can't put three pieces of wood away from each other. They've got to be close enough to touch and get the fire going. Because you've got to be next to each other. So then what you want to do is you want to hang out with somebody who's got fire. But what happens if we don't have fire? Do we put out the fire in others? Do we, ah, oh, you know. You know how it is. I'm content. I got my salvation. Okay, thank you, Lord. He reminded me of something. Get ready, Jackie. Luke 17, <clears throat> verse 26. I can hear her little fingers going 100 miles an hour back there. <laughs> As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, if you're in Bible study this Wednesday, Pastor talked about the days of Noah because there was an ark built. And in that ark being built, oh, it was a great analogy, wasn't it, Terry? I mean, it got me all fired up till I got up. And I, was, I was pretty beat up that day from doing some ministry, and I was dragging pretty bad until the Holy Ghost fell on me. And I got up and prophesied over the people. Because, see, the ark had a roof on it. And that roof is the same word for glory. And so his creation got into a place of safety, and the glory covered them. 
Okay? So what were the days of Noah like? Go outside and look. What's going on in the world right now is the same thing that was going on in the days of Noah. And they ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah was entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Keep going, Jackie. And it was in the days of Noah, oh, and, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate and drank and married wives and did all this stuff. That's what's going on right now. Everybody thinks it's okay. There's no urgency in anybody's heart. You ready? You got to get urgent. Why would Jesus? This is in the red, people. This is in the red. This ain't just oh, Paul heard this, John heard. No, this is Jesus talking. So it was in the day of Lot. They ate, they drank, and brought, and they sold, and they planted, and they built, and on the day of Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the days when the Son of Man is revealed. What is God speaking? The day I come back, this is what the condition of the world will be. See, God had to come and stop something in the days of Noah because man's heart became wicked. And now we say what is right is sin, and what we say is wrong is righteousness. We're in those days. And he goes in there, he said, hey, by the way, just, just remember Lot's wife. She couldn't let go. Pillar of salt. She looked back. Are we looking back? Do we need to be delivered today? Do we need something to move us on today? See, this wasn't part of my message. He just kind of dropped it into me. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you in the night, there will be two, one in one bed, one will be taken, the other will be left. There's a point where we think there are people, all of us are going to go. No, we ain't. So we're going to play a song here in a minute. But before I do it, the word I got from the Lord for you, and you at home were watching, where any of us sees in a desperation versus devastation. I've talked about this so long. I, and what the Lord put on me, we're about to end the days of desperation. And we're about to enter the days of devastation. And he told me today, he said, come, come after, after me while, while you're, you're desperate and you will be covered and protected. But if you do not, you will understand the desperation will be upon your heart for the wickedness that will overcome you. And without me, you may not make it. Because devastation is coming upon the land because they will not repent. So he says to my people, be desperate today. And in that desperation, I will be your covering. I will be your victory. I will be your protection. I will be your God. Because I desire none to be going through devastation. That's the word he gave me this morning. We're almost to the end of the grace and mercy that he desires to give us. It isn't a game anymore, he says. Your pastor's been crying and screaming at you for a long time, he says. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! God, the guy drives me nuts. I can hear you. <laughs> Does he ever calm down? Does he ever keep? I can't. I'm provoked. I am provoked. You can't sit in that office like I've sat in that office for 25 years and see the hand of God deliver people from satanic cults, from Masonic curses, from abuse that you don't even want to know about, and see the glory of God come over them and not get provoked that you want it for all. 
You can't calm down. You can't be easy going. You've got to be stirred up. You've got to be agitated. You've got to have a vision that the giant wake up. You've got to awaken the dead in yourself to find out what needs to be alive in Christ. You've got to find out what idols in your heart that's keeping the fire of God from you. You've got to know these things. You can't be content and satisfied just with your salvation when others are going to hell. Because if you have that contentment, you don't have the Spirit of God working in you because God wants all to be saved and none to perish. Terry? Jackie has it? Okay. When I tell you Jackie, okay? Thank you. I'm going to play a song. Okay? I was worshiping today, and this song came on. I went, oh. This song has bugged me because how the lyrics are written, and my ears can't hear sometimes as well as other people's ears. But he told me to play this song because this matches what Pastor Paul saw before he started the Bible study. We've been praying for a wildfire, a grass fire. And if we would sit down with Nicole and talk to her about grass fires, she would tell you how they're trained. You've got to get ahead of it because it goes so fast. You don't stop the fire right there. You've got to get down the road. And they, the cats come out and cut a deal because that grass fire moves so fast. But what we're praying for is a grass fire, a wildfire. So what the Lord asked me to do is if you would entertain this old guy, this preacher who can barely get through the excitement of Jesus. And, and, you know, I, I've been, I'm, so, I'm so burdened down, and I don't know if I'll be able to finish this message. <laughs> if you would stand up for a moment, and then when Jackie plays this song, I want you to listen to the lyrics. I want you to listen to the words. Okay? That's all I want. Close your eyes. Turn off your hunger for food. Turn off anything that's going on in you, but listen to the words. Okay? All right. All right, Jackie. I surrender my obsession to control you as I please. A little louder, please.
The words of that song I struggled with for a while till I understood what that singer was saying. We're the ones that hold you back. In the words of this song, it says, let him be, let him go free. And I struggled with that for a long time, Lord. And we don't understand what is within us that we contain our idols, that we don't let him move the way he wants to to us. He desires that he would be a wildfire. But he is a gentleman. He is a God of peace and mercy, and he's not a God who overrides our will. So in these words, O oh God, that were being sung, he says, let me go. Let me be. I've set you free. Now let me be free in you. Let me move in you. Get rid of those things that hold me back. See, he will not override your will. We think we've surrendered our will. The closer you get to him, you'll realize how far you are from his will. And he doesn't, he's not angry. But what he's saying today, he wants to stir your heart. So that you'll let him be who he is. That he will be the wildfire in you. He'll be the one who will burn in you. He set you free that he would be free to move. See, when we get saved, he says, when I washed you and cleansed you, we were enemies. We were separated. And now we're not. Now you are my children. Now you're mine. Now he says, let me be what I want to be in you. And we hold him back without even recognizing. We hold him back without even understanding. And today he says, I want to be a wildfire that burns through Tehama County. I want to be a wildfire that wakes up the head of the giant. And as the head wakes up, then the valley would begin to stir. And the church of Jesus Christ, the giant that it is, would stand up. And then the saying would be, as California goes, so goes the nation. He will break the curse that the church puts over California and the rest of the nation, he says. See, we're cursed, but yet we are the very last spot of major revival in Los Angeles. It shook the world. And why not have the devil, devil come after us to stop the next move of God? So I pray for your hearts today. I pray for my heart. That I would understand that maybe it would grieve me if I have withheld him from doing what he wants to do for the lost. If I withheld him because I was insecure about being prophetic, if I was afraid of offending people and didn't share the fullness of the gospel, if I had an idol, which is even myself, that I would not be destroyed, then God have mercy and forgive me. And so we don't even understand what it means to totally let God have his way. 
But he says, I am a good God. I'm a gentle God. I'm a kind God. I'm a merciful God. I'm a compassionate God. I want to give you all of that as I change you. I want all of you to know of my goodness so that the world might know that I came for them. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask for a fire to come. A fire that comes from you, for you are an all-consuming fire. And so I ask, Lord, I don't know if anyone needs to come forward or if they just need to do it where they're at, but this is between you and the living God. And if you want me to pray over you, I'll be happy to. But the most important thing is, did you hear God today? Has he stirred you? Has he got you all fired up inside saying, "Uh uh-oh, I want the more. Am I provoked to go after God? I'm agitated about the destruction that's going on in the land. And my God is the answer to it all. And so, Holy Spirit, have your way with your people. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. If you desire prayer, I'll be happy, or somebody will be happy to pray for you.